No problem. Can everybody else hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? Okay, cool. That's now, uh, before you actually turn on anything, um, make sure that, well, when you first turn it on, I should say, uh, make sure your finder scope is properly aligned with your main telescope. That helps speed up the alignment procedure no end. Uh, the other thing is, uh, start off, always start off using a low power light piece. Yeah, that will help, again, will help you find things in the sky a lot easier than the high power light piece. Mm -hmm. So let's presume both of those things have been done and we'll turn on the telescope. Now, handset should light up and give you the uh, usual, you know, welcoming message, don't point it at the sun. <laughs> right, so you turn on the handset. It will give you a welcoming message, different handsets will give you a different welcoming message. Just press enter and it will skip past it. Now, this, uh, this one uh, being a Celestron handset will get you to choose the um, alignment procedure first. Uh, another pop popular make would be the Skywatcher handsets and that, um, that will get you to enter in your location data so on and so forth first and then ask you which one do you want to do. So it doesn't really matter which way around it goes. Uh, each, each procedure will take care of itself. Forgive me for butting in. Shall I yeah. just say one thing before we go any further? Um, we've got as far as being switched on. Before you switch your telescope on, something very, very important. Think about what power supply you're going to use. Mm -hmm. If you use the wrong one, if you use batteries which are not 100%, if you mix your batteries, if you use the wrong type of power supply, not only might you jam the handset, but you might cause an issue with it which is not covered by the warranty if you use the wrong power supply. So pay attention to your telescope instructions. If it says use AA alkalines, you're fine. Um, but if you're going to plug in an external power source, be very careful what it is. Just plugging into your car cigarette lighter, for example, is not a good idea because it's not a regulated 12 volts. Use something that's regulated. If you're not sure, you can call us or email us and ask us anytime. We'll tell you what you can use and can't. But once you've got this far, this is what you do next. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, for this one here, I'm now going to uh, pick the alignment procedure I want. Um, there are many different kinds of alignment procedures, different ones for different brands of telescopes, but they all basically work in exactly the same way. They will get you to choose between one and three items up in the night sky, preferably stars, and you're going to centre the telescope on each one in turn. And then the telescope gets its bearings, knows exactly where everything is. It's basically a calibration routine. Um, I'm not going to go through each and every alignment procedure here in detail. That would just take too long and we'll fall asleep. So uh, right now, for this particular purpose on this Celestron, I'm just going to pick the simplest one, which is solar system alignment. Yeah? Next simpler, uh, the next most simple one would be one star alignment. Yeah? So. That's not really that important. The, the important thing here is to install the procedure of how to do it, how to go into each one. So I'm just going to pick the alignment procedure here. <coughs> now, the first thing it's going to ask me for is the time. Yeah. Um, at the moment, what is it? It's just gone past nine o'clock. Okay. I've got, I've got 21:05. 21:07. As long as it's accurate within a few minutes, the go-to will still be accurate. But try to get it as good as you can. So, what was it again? 9.07 you said. Okay. Um, you enter in the time in the uh, 24 hour format. Yeah, so right now I'm putting in 21.07. Okay. Press enter and it will move on to the next screen. Uh, this one's asking me is it daylight savings or not? Uh, basically, if it's uh, summertime and uh, the clocks have gone forwards, uh, then it's daylight savings. Winter time, when they go back, you, you say no. So summertime yes, winter time no, when the clocks change. Yeah. So right now, same thing like savings, I don't have to change it, so I'll enter and I'll skip on to the next. Now, all the handsets will ask you what time zone are you in. Yeah. So this one currently is on Pacific USA time, which obviously we're not. So I'm just going to skip through it. Right here in London, in England, we're pretty lucky. We're right on the Greenwich Meridian. So we're time zone zero, zero, zero. Um, if I was to go to Spain, for example, which is one hour ahead, I'd be, that would be time zone plus one. If I was to go somewhere else that was uh, one hour behind, that would be minus one, so on and so forth. 
if you look in your original instruction manual, that usually at the back there's a world map and it's sectioned out into the time zones just in case you want to move anywhere. Okay? So right now I'm going to put it down as universal time in group zero. Okay? Um, next it will just ask you for the date. Um, the date on all the handsets that I know is nearly always in the American format, so it will be month, day, year. Okay? So for today, for example, we'd put 08-20-14. Okay, and enter that. Now, the mount now knows where um, now knows where we are on the earth. It knows what time it is. It knows what date it is. So it's got a very good rough idea what your horizon is and what's above you in the sky and where the position of the objects are. Yeah but roughly isn't quite good enough for uh, quite a few of the objects. It's okay for the uh, moon and planets because they're uh, relatively easy to find, but for deep space objects, you're gonna need greater and greater accuracy, okay? This is where the alignment procedure comes in. So right now, um, I'm doing something called a solar system align, which is the, the easiest one to do, the simplest one to do. It's very much like all of the others, but instead of aligning on stars, uh, you'd pick a planet and you'd align it on the planet, okay? Unfortunately, there's not really anything visible now. Actually, there is. Saturn. Saturn. Yep. We've, we've got, got Mars and Saturn, Saturn, Saturn. Yeah. right? A bit low so, down, but so what I'm going to do, I've selected Saturn to align to, mm -hmm. yeah, and I'm going to press enter. Now, the handset is now telling me, please point the telescope at Saturn and get it centered as you can, yeah? So what I'm going to do now <laughs> is exactly that. I'm just going to turn it around. Yeah. If people want to have a look around and see, you yep. can see Mars and Saturn. So you can see the bright tower over there. Look above them in the like 11 o'clock position. And you've got two planets, two bright stars, it looks like, in a line pointing towards the lower right, towards the tower. The lower one is Mars, the other one is Saturn. Okay. You can't see the red colour of Mars, but okay. the one is Mars. It's still a bit more redder than actually than Saturn. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, sir. Would you mind taking just one step? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So right now, I'm just pointing it roughly at Saturn. With the uh, with the celestial version of things, when you're aligning like this, it presumes that you're using proper procedure, which is first of all get it in your finder scope and then second get it in the eyepiece. Um, what you'll notice is once you've got it centered in the finder scope, I'm not going to do everything properly now because I'm you know pressed for time, but um, let's say I've got it centered in the finder scope nicely, then I'll press enter and it will automatically slow down the motor. Yeah before you could hear it and see it moving. Now if I press the buttons can't see and hear it moving yeah. because it's moving very, very slowly. What it presumes is that the two, the telescope and finder scope, have already been aligned. You've got it in the finder scope already, and now it's because you've got it in the finder scope, it's somewhere in the field of view of the main eyepiece. So it slows down the motor so you can easily put it into the center of the field of view of the main eyepiece. So, your question that's why you mentioned in the beginning that it's very important to have the alignment. Yeah, because to have if you have the field view alignment correct, yes. then basically everything goes flows with that. That's right. Otherwise, at this point, you'd be faffing around for 10 yeah. 15 minutes you trying to do to it. Find it yeah. Exactly. Right? So, right now, let's presume that I've got it centered in here, I've now got it centered in the eyepiece. And I'll press, I'll press a line instead of enter. It prompts you everything on the screen, tells you which button to press next. Yeah, and it's said align, uh, align success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So from now on, I can just use the functions of the handset as you would. So right now, I'll press solar system, and I'll tell it, okay, I want to take a look at Mars. I'll press enter, and the way it goes. Mm -hmm. It will not actually the correct position of Mars. Yeah. Well, actually, it's not so bad for a phantom one. It's pointing <laughs> roughly where it's supposed to be. So that's the end of it, the procedure. From then on, you'll just use your handset normally and surf from object to object. That's pretty much it. But then when you surf from the object to object, <laughs> yeah. you put the coordinates in? Or? Um, you can put coordinates, but otherwise, if you take a look on the handset here, um, everything's labeled. So you have one button for solar system, yeah. one for stars, one for deep sky. Right. So. 
if you press that, so for example, I've shown you solar system. But if, we if you back, want to go somewhere in deep sky. Deep sky. So I'll press deep sky. Yeah. So it gives you options. Yeah. You have named uh, named objects, one catalog, new generation, and others. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to named objects, which is probably the most popular, mm -hmm. the presenter. And now it's giving us the names of all of the deep sky objects which are visible at the current time. Right. Because okay. it knows what's up and what's not. Because you've already told it and you've done the alignment procedure. Right. So it's not going to put anything on the list which you can't see at the time, you know, because it's hidden by the earth. Right. So now when you do that, it will automatically move to that? That's right, yeah. So after that, you just scroll through the list yeah. and it changes. Yeah. It's just like surfing channels on intelligence. Yeah. yeah. And when you stop on the one that you want, in this case, Ringtail Galaxy, just press enter, and off it goes, because it's already aligned. The more stars you use in your alignment routine, the greater the accuracy will be. Another word, the final word about accuracy with the alignment is this. If you want a very, very accurate alignment, always use the two or preferably three star alignment routine on your telescope. When you pick the stars to align to, if possible, try to make sure they're well spread out through the sky. Yeah. The reason yeah. being, the, tri nice the, the triangle that they make, the tracking accuracy is best within that triangle. So if we pick three stars which are well spread apart, that gives us a really wide, big triangle that it's accurate in. Otherwise, if you want to center on, say, one particular, um, one particular place in the sky, uh, let's say you were going to be exploring around Cassiopeia tonight or something like that. If you pick the three stars to encompass that area, again, the tracking accuracy will be greatest within that area. Yeah. So that will help you out. That's very true, but what offsets that slightly is the fact that the further the stars are apart in the sky, the longer it takes to get them to the other. And the longer you take over your alignment, the more likely it is to fail. The reason being is, is you Drifting. go that is away from the sky, yeah, that's right. the Earth turns slightly, so the second star is positioned up there you might want to do things. So if you pick stars that are too far apart or you take too long on your alignment, it will fail. It happens to all of the chaps in it, it happens to me. It happens to just do it again. And then as soon as you've got it, that's it. Do you, do you need to know what the name of the star is that you're... With Celestron, you don't. That's the beauty of the Celestron system. The sky will actually go to the name of the star. With Celestron, you don't. So I missed that last yeah. Can you explain so why it doesn't need the star name? So how it it's, how, it's how it yeah. asks you, yeah. basically. It's, um, sorry, sorry. it's uh, with the uh, Skywatcher one, when you're aligning, it will, it, will t it will give you a list of stars and say, okay, which one would you like to go to? Right. Yeah. With the Celestron one, it has procedures like that, but it also has other procedures which simply say, point me at the first star. So you don't need to know the name, you just look up and say, okay, <laughs> that one there. <laughs> That's right, you can work out which is which. Yeah. The other thing is, if you think about it, if you pick any three stars in the sky, that's a pretty unique triangle. Mm -hmm. Those, that precise shape is not going to be duplicated anywhere else in the sky. It's like a thing. The restaurant system can recognize that unique triangle of stars. Yeah. So it's always better to the area of the sky you want to study or observe to kind of have the triangle around that and then if you shift to a different area you will have a different triangle. Around. Well, it, that would mean you'd have to keep on doing the alignment procedure. Right. But if you know you're going to be shifting around, then just do a bigger triangle. Okay. To encompass everything. Yeah. Um, no, a bit too small. Too close together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a bit too small. Um, Ideally, they would be on the same side of the sky, but as far apart as possible. That's right. uh, but just a word on the Skywatcher alignment procedures. Um, if you don't already know the names of the stars, um, if you imagine moving into a new neighbourhood, the amount of time it takes you to learn, learn the names of the roads around you is about the same amount of time it will take you to learn the names of the major stars up in the sky. So it's not really that difficult. Yeah. Is there any, anyone you say is preferable to get between Skywatcher and Celestron, is it? They're, they're on a par with each other, it just depends on the exact specifics of what you want from the system. There's, it's not one's better than the other. Very rarely do they do exactly the same thing. Um, yeah. Skywatcher have got a telescope like this one. Um, Celestron have got a telescope that looks similar to this one. It costs more, but you get different accessories, you get a longer warranty. It depends on the individual. 
so as, as a beginner, let's say you want to kind of develop this as a hobby, yeah. what would you recommend or suggest to start what with? What we would recommend is the telescope that you're going to use the most. That's the key thing to right. do. Yeah, we'd love to sell you something big and shiny and whatever. Yeah. If you don't use it, it's the wrong one. Yeah, it has to be something that, yeah. that gets used with you. It's like practicality more than anything. Yeah. It is. It's a case of practicality, yeah. yeah. That's right. I mean, uh, can you imagine if I uh, if I live um, ten floors up in a, in a flat? Yeah, uh, John, John's great big white telescope over there wouldn't be very good for me, but something like this would be absolutely perfect. Yeah. And does this thing weigh a lot? Um, no, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Um, you can you can easily pick it up and move it around, and the whole thing comes apart into sections anyway. I carried uh, both of these into the park together. My oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Nearly killed me, but I did it. <laughs> You don't look for that. <laughs> yeah, they're not heavy. They're not yeah. heavy yeah. 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 So, it's, uh, does anybody have any more questions? Anything they'd like to ask? Can I ask you about the, 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 the telescope? Of course. Yeah. 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 I mean, as soon as it's over, we'll start pointing at stuff. What would generally care? Like, like, for example, when you're moving the right, the glasses can move as well. So. No, that's fine. Um, if you pick, um, the only uh, kind of telescopes that uh, require um, adjustment of the optics on a regular basis, uh, that's called collimation, they are Newtonian telescopes. Uh, refractors and compound telescopes like these ones, the optics are pretty well fixed in place. Yeah. Um, Maxitov's totally fixed in place, Ref refractors totally fixed in place. Schmidthauser Greens, if given very rough treatments, will need it once every year or two, something like that. And that's only the slightest adjustment. So it's not really a concern with those kinds of telescopes. For that, you will take the telescope to place a shop and they will do it for you. Uh, you can do it by yourself. Yes, you can do it uh, in the shop, but it's also not that difficult to do it on your own. Um, you do something called star testing. Uh, you just get a you get a star in the field of view at high, very high magnifications, higher than you'd normally use, and you defocus the image. Uh, that will give something called an airy disk. Um, it looks like a bullseye pattern, black and white. Uh, from the pattern, you can tell how the telescope is misaligned or not. And then on the front of it here, you've got three little screws, and you just adjust them so the pattern comes to the optimal form. And then it's in, then it's in perfect condition again. So it's pretty easy. It just takes a little bit of time. Isn't it something like you will learn along the way? And yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. But so, some people um, are a little bit nervous or afraid to do it because they're unsure of the unknown. So, but it, it really, um, it really isn't anything to be afraid of. If you do things slowly, carefully, and with some thought, you'll get it done first time correctly. And then after you've done it two, three times, it will be natural, and you wonder what you were worried about. Right. Right. Okay. So you get used to it, just like musically you tune a guitar. Exactly. I mean. And, and you know, if you do get a telescope from us in the shop, yeah. you've also bought support. So at any time, you can give us a call, contact us on Facebook, do whatever, and uh, we'll help you out. If we're there, we'll help you. How much this one cost, actually? This actual one here? Yeah. Uh, this is the six inch one. It's around about 850 pounds. Yeah. Uh, around about 850 for this one. Um, this one, oh, sorry, Simon. This, this one here, uh, you can get between 430 to 475. Five, it's only an inch less in aperture, and they put. Yeah, they're all inclusive. Um, if you buy any one of these from either Skywatcher or Celestron, um, you get everything you need out of the box that night to observe, other than a power source. Right, but what about the Starry Night software? Because the software you can also use to kind of right. study the stars, what the position will be. That's right. Um, Starry Night is a very large, complex program. Yeah. Um, not only is it a, a planetarium program, but, it will uh, but you can also uh, do imaging and telescope, telescope control through it. It's really quite a complex thing. Um, I would recommend starting off on something like Stellarium or Sky Safari. Yeah? Um, Stellarium is absolutely free. You can download it for all systems, for Macintosh or Windows. Uh, if you go home tonight, you can download it in about 30 seconds. And that's a free planetarium program. It's the one I use the most.